come into the meeting. Um, good morning. As you come into the meeting, just usual um, protocol, put yourself on mute. Um, please note that the session is being recorded and it will be made available for people who can't attend at this time. So um, welcome to this Leanne's event on libraries and pay equity. And we'll start this morning with a karakia and uh, Philip Miles from Leanza Council will kindly do that for us. Thanks, Philip. Mauri Tipua, a Pakari might poor, no might a Mauri, Homie, Huie, Taikie. Thank you, thanks so much. Uh, Kira Tato, a co Kaitoho Tira Haringa or A Tero, a ho, no Tifanganui, a Tara ho, co Anna Pickering Toku Ingoa. Uh, good morning, I'm Anna Pickering, the Executive Director for Lianza, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to this event. The importance of pay equity for the library and information sectors really made evident by the number of people uh, joining us online today and I know a lot of people will be really keen to uh, look at the recording afterwards. So I just wanted to just take a little a bit of time just to thank our panellists for being here to engage in this important kōrero and to update our sector on their work. So a very warm welcome to all the school librarians joining us today and to everyone from public, tertiary, special and other libraries. Um, we're really delighted to be engaging with the three unions that are working on the pay equity claims across the library and information sector. And I would uh, like to thank uh, Sarah Proctor-Thompson from uh, TEU, Sarah Stone from PSA and Stephanie Mills, who's the National Secretary for NZDI, for being here today. And we're also very fortunate to have some library professionals who are involved in this pay equity work who will be sharing what they've been up to. Uh, Claire Forrest, welcome. She's on the SLANS exec and is a member of the NZDI pay team who have uh, begun negotiating in the last month. Uh, Tessa Bowler from Wellington City Libraries, I hope is here too, uh, involved in the PSA um, uh, core library group uh, and she's worked on informing the claim and interviewing public library workers and Hannah Jenkins from Victoria University Library who's a member of the TEU pay equity reference group so welcome to you all and thank you so much for your time um, I would also like to acknowledge Sasha Eastwood who's the Slanza president who is a member of the NZDI negotiations team and I'm not sure if she's here today but um, I think she had been hoping to be so uh, each presenter will introduce themselves as they begin their part of today's presentation. If you have some questions, please put these into the chat and we will choose some for our panel to answer in the last 15 minutes today. Um, so thank you so much. And it's now my pleasure to hand over to Sarah Proctor Thompson, TEU, who will begin by explaining what pay equity is. Tēnā uh, koutou katoa. Te pau whirinaki a hau ki te hautu kahirangi. I am the National Women's Officer of the Tertiary Education Union. And I've got five minutes to talk about what pay equity is. Um, and to do that, I thought I'd just um, go back more than 50 years um, to talk about uh, in the middle of the 20th century, the fact that uh, women and men still, it was legal to pay women and men uh, different rates of pay for exactly the same work. Uh, and there was a lot of agitation around that time. And in 1960, um, the public sector uh, passed legislation that made it illegal within the public sector to have different rates of pay. And by 1972, um, the Equal Pay Act was legislated, which set a framework for removing and preventing differential pay rates for men and women uh, on the basis of their sex across all sectors, including the private sector. And that legislation is the legislation that guides our work today and that sets the scene for the pay equity claims that we are all talking about today. Um, so when that legislation was passed, uh, the main uh, focus in the first instance was about equal pay rates for men and women doing the same work. So in the pay equity biz, that's called equal pay. Uh, and if you think about it within the libraries, that might be looking at your own organization and determining whether male and female librarians get the same rate of pay for uh, the same work. Um, now that was passed in 1972. We know that 
50 years later, uh, we there is still unequal pay. And certainly within the tertiary education sector, we know, for example, uh, that uh, processes of appointment, promotion and progression decisions all feed into large gender pay gaps in our sector. Um, and in the case of female lecturers, for example, even when you set research performance experience qualifications as being the same, there's still a large gap. So that's equal pay. Um, and that, that was really um, the first set of considerations around the legislation. However, the legislation also provides for pay equity. And that's what we're talking about today. And uh, uh, pay equity is where um, work of equal value is paid equally. So it doesn't have to be the same work. It can be work of equivalent uh, skills, demands, requirements, um, and that work being paid equally. And the, uh, the key case that proved uh, issues of pay inequity was, of course, the Christine Bartlett case um, and her work with her union, uh, Service and Food Workers, and ETU. Uh, and so they argued that because care work had historically been female dominated, uh, it had consistently been undervalued. So the work and skills that they actually had to use in their work was undervalued and underpaid in comparison to equivalent um, roles that hadn't been undervalued. So that is our key notion, pay equity. Uh, and it's the thing that uh, has opened up a whole set of claims uh, from female dominated sectors uh, to, to try to achieve pay equity. So um, there's been a number of settled claims for social workers, teacher aides, admin and clerical workers, uh, kairahi te reo, allied healthcare workers, who have all made this argument that female dominated areas of work have been historically and consistently undervalued and that there is a requirement to evaluate that work to um, expose the true value of their work and then work out what is a fair remuneration. Um, so the way it is assessed, pay equity is assessed, is really understanding that full value um, of the work and comparing that work to areas that haven't been undervalued. And I think um, Sarah Stone will probably say a little bit more about that process of evaluation. Um, but before I finish my five minutes of fame, um, I, I did just want to talk about um, pay parity, which is the third term that you might hear in this conversation of talking around gender pay equity. And pay parity refers to equal pay for workers doing the same work, but in different organizations or workplaces. Um, so in our sector, in the tertiary education sector, an example would be that across our politics, librarians are paid differently, quite differently. Um, there's no standard rates of pay across our sector. And the same is true for our universities. And so seeking parity is, um, and, oh, and actually the difference between university uh, library workers and polytech library workers is even more significant. So pay parity for us would mean um, fair and equitable pay for library work right ac across our sector. Um, we are a long way from that. And one of our first steps is actually looking at pay equity um, for a group of library workers in our university as our first step. And that's all I'm gonna say. I hope that's a outline of the key terms, and I can hand over to Sarah. Um, I'm a customer service uh, librarian here at Wellington City Libraries, and I'm here today to talk um, you all through the process of our pay equity claim through the PSA. So I'm going to run you really quickly through how we chose which library assistants to interview, um, the interview process itself, and our plans for the next part of the process, which is comparing library assistant um, jobs to male and uh, male-dominated um, roles. Cool. So 
I'm part of a pay equity team led by Sarah from the PSA. We have about 10 other library assistants from councils around the, um, around the country who are involved in the claim. So there are about six other councils involved in the claim. And I don't, can't remember off the top of my head, but <laughs> um, yeah, so some of us like me, we, um, I did the in interviews with other library assistants and some of us are the ones that are gonna be doing the comparing, the compar comparator work is coming up. Um, cool, okay. <laughs> so um, first off, what we had to do is to choose who to interview. So each of the, count the six councils put out about, about four to about two to four people um, from their library network to interview. Um, and we got those people from a poll of people who indicated in a survey from the PSA that they were willing to be interviewed. Um, okay. So as you know, library assistant work is super diverse. So we wanted, we wanted a bunch of interviewees that really reflected how diverse the work is. So we have people that worked in little tiny branch libraries and like big central city libraries. We have people who work with kids, people who are focused on community outreach. We had um, people who are migrants, like didn't, weren't born in New Zealand, like Pacifica people, um, full-time workers, part-time workers, and heaps more. So we've got a really good overview of the job role of a library assistant throughout the country. Um, as we're all library assistants in the job, I mean, in the group, we really understood like how important the diversity was. Um, so the interviewees, they were mostly women, but we did have a couple of men because while it is a female dominated um, claim, like men are obviously gonna be affected by the pay rates as well. So once we had our interviewees, we had to skip to the interviews. This was huge. <laughs> So each interview ended up taking about three to four hours each. So really in depth. Um, we did this, we each of our interviews we did um, alongside someone from the HR department in our council. Um, I was really lucky because I had a really good relationship with our HR person. So we'd done other PSA stuff before. So it was a really, it's quite a nice, exhausting, but like quite rewarding process. Um, but in order to keep it unbiased, we interviewed people not from our libraries, from other libraries. So, for example, I interviewed two people from Tauranga Libraries and one person from Auckland City Libraries. Cool. So, the interviews were done using this really awesome toolkit called Te Oruaru, which was designed by the Public Service Commission. It's basically it's a question, questionnaire and a scoring system, which is designed to assess any job in New Zealand. It's made up of 15 sets of questions, which they call factors. And each one covers a different kind of skill set or effort or responsibility in your job. What's really important about Te Oruaru, as opposed to like other job assessment tools, is that it accounts for things like um, soft skills. So things like the emotional effort you put into a job or your communication skills. It also has a section for um, Te Ana Māori um, skills and responsibilities that you bring to the role which is awesome because, again, as a library assistant, you understand how important, like, te reo and te ao Māori stuff is in our jobs. Okay, so to give you an idea of te Oruaru, I thought I would quickly show you one of the factors. Oh, that, um, and it's one of the factors that I think the, our interviewees had the most to say about, which was the interpersonal communication skills. So I'm just going to share my screen. I've never done this before, so... Bear with me. Okay. Cool. So here are all the questions for this one factor. So as you can see, that uh, it's really- I can't see your screen, Tessa. What did I do wrong? Oh, shit, down the bottom. Got it. <laughs> sorry, sorry, everybody. So, yes, factor three interpersonal communication skills. As you can see, they're very, there's a lot of them and they're very in depth. What I thought I would do is focus in on one that um, really resonated with me because, to be honest, I didn't think of it as a skill until I came across this, this um, questionnaire. And it was, how do you adapt to your, your communication style when communicating with people from different walks of life? Now think about like 
So if you just think about how many people like come into a library every day, like within minutes, you can talk from someone, you talk to a little kid who, you know, is looking for a comic book to, you know, a grumpy patron about debt to someone who's really neurodivergent. Like these people all require very different tiles of communication. And you have to jump between them really quickly. And you have to assess what kind of communication skill you need really quickly. To, and you just, honestly, you just do it effortlessly, effortlessly and a, as a library assistant jumping between those different, the different styles. So since realizing this is an actual skill and not just something any human can do, I've had lots of fun like pointing it out to my coworkers being like, you just did this and that's a proper skill that you should like be proud of, which is nice because I think that we don't always realize that communication skills are like a skill that we all, yeah, <laughs> we use every day. So that's, um, I'll stop sharing now. So yeah, that was one of the um, one of the questions we had for the, the booklet. So we started interviews in September and we finished the interviews in early, early October. Um, we wanted to get them done quicker, but of course COVID got in the way. Um, there are about 23 interviews in total, I'm pretty sure. And we all did about two to three interviews each. And as I said before, they took four, three to four hours. So we're really grateful for the interviewees who took the time out of their busy schedules to help us, because that's awesome. Okay. So now we're in the process of organizing the second step, which is comparing the interviews against ones done with people in male-dominated jobs. We're really lucky because several paper claims have already gone through and they've used the same um, tool as us, Te Oruwaru, which means that there's already a pool of interviews. So we can just use those interviews for our comparators. Okay, so what's gonna happen is that each question is marked against a factor plan for Te Oruwaru. Now I'm going to show you the fact. Okay, so this is the one for interpersonal communication skills. And what the, um, the comparator group is going to do is that they will read through these and decide, where, based on the answers, what, um, uh, what factor women and what, what level the, the job is at in this particular factor. So I won't read them out because they're quite long, but just looking at it for me, I think that my job every day would be about a four. Talks about um, good people responsive skills, um, de-escalating emotionally charged situations, and communicating in a multicultural environment. I think that's all sort of skills that we use every day. If you go up further at five, like it has all the same stuff, but it mentions counselling skills, and I don't think that a library assistant uses that on a daily basis. So if I was looking at that, I would say we'd be a four out of six, just reasonably high. So the next step after that, if you've decided that you're a four, if the group also decides that you, you know we're a four, you'd go to the factor um, score thing, factor score booklet, and it's covered, unfortunately, just here. Anyway, so number four would be, it's a 60 out of a possible of 90. So that's a pretty high score for us, for, you know, for something that we use all the time. So, Okay, don't worry about that. <laughs> um, okay, so each of the factors will be scored like this. So each factor, you would read the interviewees' um, responses to the questions and you decide where, and where they sit with that factor. Um, and once we have a score, we'll total up to like what, 400, 500, 300, something like that. Um, we would look at other jobs in the, the pool of um, interviews that we have. And if they are similar, I mean, our page should be similar to theirs. What I think people really struggle with is the idea that we're going to be compared to jobs that are completely different from ours. So, for example, one of the jobs in the repository is fisheries workers. It's totally different from what we do, right? Like, they're outside, lifting heavy, like, bins of fish. They're working in the elements outdoors. 
different. But what matters at the end of the day is the, is the final score, the final tally up of um, the factor scores at the end. So while they might mark really highly in things like um, physical, physical effort and like working conditions, we would get low scores there because we don't lift as much and we work inside most buildings, but they might not get very, they probably won't get very high skills and things like communication or emotional effort, which we're going to score really highly in. So even if it's different kinds of responsibilities, efforts, skills and stuff, we might, we're probably going to, we most likely could end up with a similar score and therefore we deserve to be paid the same amount. Te Oruwaro is about, um, what's it called? Um, valuing different kinds of skills and effort. I mean, like, not even if it's like something like physical effort, which we're more used to valuing over something like emotional effort, like it's putting a similar value on both of those things. I hope that makes sense to everybody. <laughs> It's really complicated, <laughs> so I hope that um, it makes sense. But if you've got any questions, um, we'll try answer them. Should I talk about my next topic now as well, which is why the pay equity claim matters? No one's telling me not to, so I will. <laughs> okay, stop sharing my camera. That's awesome. Okay, so um, I was thinking about this question because it was a bit meaty. So before I did the interviews. I would have said something like, it matters because we work hard and we deserve to get paid more. And we have cool skills, we have awesome, useful skills that should be valued better by our employers. And that's totally still true. But I also think since doing the interviews, I don't feel like we value our skills um, that we bring to our jobs today enough. And I think that one of the cool things about pay equity is that it's going to show the average library system that like their skills are important and really valued like this one woman i interviewed she drives the book bus and she began kind of i felt like talking down what she does she just said she drives it around and issues books and comes back to the library at the end of the day but like as we did the interview we talked about her day and like she has to drive an 11 meter long bus um she has to get a heavy vehicles license for that like i couldn't do that that's, that's a proper skill She's often alone, so she's dealing with customers with mobility issues and um, or tricky, you know, deep things like that, membership queries, that sort of stuff, um, you know, vulnerable people, that sort of thing, all by herself out in the world, away from the library, on the book bus. She has to have such a good knowledge of her collection, because a lot of the people she visits are people like rest homes and stuff like that, so she's... And she's like, they need more help. They need to be helped by like pre-selection and stuff like that. She needs to be know that like X person likes mysteries and X person likes this. And they need to have books on the bus that they want and they've not read before. She they like knowledge of both the patrons and the collection. And also like, she's also going to have like troubleshooting knowledge, like basic bus knowledge of the bus and how the bus works and also like the technology on the bus things like the, the issuing system, the computers, all that sort of stuff. And people come in with like te um, technology questions, like, you know, what do I, how do I do X, Y, and Z on my iPad and stuff like that. Like she's got huge amounts of responsibility on that little bus all by herself. And those are huge, those are skills. The skills, that's a huge amount of effort you've spent every day. And if you just asked her on the street, I'm not sure that she'd be able to say that like, her job is a cop. She would willingly say that her job is complex and difficult and requires a lot of effort and responsibilities and skills. So yeah, I think it's important because once our employers start paying us more, we might start valuing our jobs more as well and valuing what we bring to them and our skills. <sighs> okay, that's all I have. I hope it makes sense. Please feel free to ask any questions. Thanks very much. Thank you, Tessa. Thank you so much. I think we might go now to um, Stephanie and Claire um, to give us a, a, a roundup on the um, NZDI claim. Thank you. Uh, kia ora, Anna, and thanks very much for this opportunity. Um, I'm not going to speak too long um, because Claire is the real expert here. I just really want to um, tell Toko what Tessa said 
Uh, when we first started doing this work, it used to make me sad and furious that many people in education would say, I'm just a teacher aide, or I'm just a librarian, or I'm just something else. And I think what we've shown through doing this process is not just about valuing people better in terms of money, but we've also taken the approach that it has to be a, a journey, that um, our pay equity settlements have also included commitments by the employer to professional learning and development uh, to career pathways um, because and, and also to ongoing uh, ways to change funding systems so that pay equity can continue to be um, sustained and maintained. So I think, um, yeah, Kia Kaha Tisa and everybody involved in this process is absolutely huge. I mean, we started our first uh, pay equity uh, um, claim in uh, education was actually for Ministry of Education learning support support workers uh, who work primarily in early childhood education services. And um, that was actually prior to the amendment of the Equal Pay Act. Um, and through doing that work, we then moved on to teacher aides um, and then admin kaiarahi te reo, science teacher and librarian. So it's been quite a journey for us. Um, you know, half a dozen years, and we've now also got a huge claim in for the whole of the teaching profession um, from early childhood through to secondary. And that will also include looking at the work of people who are unqualified but are doing teaching work. So I think that's the other point um, that Tess also touched on is often jobs that women have been doing, predominantly women have been doing, have been undervalued in lots of ways, including the fact that um, there hasn't been a qualifications or accreditation pathway. And so that's, that's also a huge part of how we move to value the, the incredibly um, complex uh, and emotionally challenging work that many women do across many sectors. Um, like with the, the, the uh, PSA process, uh, we've used a gender neutral tool, agreed with the Ministry of Education and the Public Service Commission. In our case, it's called Aroma Tawai, uh, which includes an element of tikanga Māori in it as well. Um, the most recent settlements for admin and kaiarahi te reo um, resulted in, for example, with kaiarahi in, in, in 79% average increases um, because things like being expert in te reo have never been recognised in the education system. So um, we are now at the stage, and I'll leave it to Claire to tell you in a bit more detail, but we've obviously gone through the um, interview process where we interviewed, I think, 30 um, different uh, uh, people working across the, the school library system, if you like. Um, we've had um, uh, that process of assessment, uh, interviewing comparators, obviously, the, going through the factors, and last week we we're, were in negotiations. Uh, we are very hopeful that we'll have a very positive outcome to announce soon. I think um, just to address a couple of the questions um, that are important, I mean, one of the key ways that you can really help with this is to join your union. Even if your union doesn't have a, a currently active claim in your area, for example, um, it is possible to argue through collective agreements to extend pay equity settlements through the pay parity process. So to say, well, those folk over there got it. Uh, we're actually doing the same job. That, that pay should be extended to us. Um, I think the other thing is that we also really encourage people to get involved in the process as Tessa and Claire have, um, because it really is, I think, as Tessa said, um, it does come to be about recognising your own value and giving yourself and your colleagues money in that way. Um, finally, I mean, I think people worry about how it's going to be paid for. Um, you know, we don't win anything by a fight, and that's where unions come in because it's all of us acting together and really acknowledge the relationship we've had um, with Slanza and with um, the Librarians Association generally, because I think it has been a really good collective effort. Um, but obviously unions have the resources and the skills um, from doing other claims to really support, uh, in this case, librarians, but lots of other uh, professional groups as well. And so um, in terms of paying for pay equity claims in the broader public sector, um, the government does have a contingency held by Treasury, which is specifically for pay equity agreements. So it doesn't come from, you know, most agencies' baseline pay. However, however, 
you know, there's always competition for money. Um, and I think one of the, the advantages we have with the Equal Pay Act was that it was amended to support pay equity settlements and claim processes um, and supported by both major parties. Well, in fact, I think everyone except possibly the Act. Um, and so it is a genuinely bipartisan piece of legislation. Um, and I think it, uh, given that the Crown is, is an enormous employer of women in services, <laughs> um, it is going to be not always easy, but the fact is, is that we do have um, both in local government and central government um, the ability to use our combined, you know, political and action and advocacy and collective strength uh, to make sure pay equity claims are not just won, but maintained and sustained. So I'll pass you over to Claire because she's got the real oil on what it was like from the inside. Thanks, Steph. Um, kia ora everyone. Uh, ko Claire Forrest Tokawingawa. I'm one of the librarians at the Raro Intermediate um, in Wellington. And yes, I have been involved um, with the school librarian pay equity claim from the beginning, uh, mostly because um, I'm hugely passionate about about it being successful, about us being um, paid what we're worth, about our mana being increased within our workplaces and understood by all of the people that we work with. I think that that, as Tessa said, I think that that's been a huge part of the process because we, um, our partnership is with, um, you know, NZDI and members have done a huge amount of work, but so have the Ministry of Education. And I'm pretty sure that they did not understand what um, teacher aides or admin staff or school librarians did within their school, their range of skills and their knowledge and their expertise. And that will be one really positive um, side effect of this whole process because, uh, yeah, everybody needs to know how amazing we all are and, and go forward from there. Um, so our claim was raised in uh, November 2020. Do you remember that year? Yeah, that was pretty pooey. Um, so um, despite COVID, we managed to interview um, school librarians in a whole range. Like like Tessa said, you wanted a, a, a diverse range. So there's all different sorts of schools and deciles and um, roles that people, um, people have um, within schools. So we went all over the country. Many were done by Zoom, but we went face to face as well. And we interviewed, so there was a person from NZDI, so usually um, a school librarian, one of us in the team, um, interviewing with uh, a member of the pay equity team from the Ministry of Education, which was actually formed a great partnership um, going on down the line because we worked together. They were paid to make sure pay equity happened. It was about my pay and about my role. So we were really, you know, really worked together on that. So so that was exciting. We gathered the evidence. So this is, you know, the tools that we're talking about here are about gather, gathering the evidence to show that we um, deserve to be, be not undervalued, basically, to be paid what we're worth and recognised for all of those things um, um, with our careers and, and with our jobs. So um, the evidence gathering was um, really interesting. And then um, what we did was before um, we gathered all of the evidence and, and had a general areas of responsibility document, which basically talked about all of the things that school librarians do. Not everybody does everything. And I understand, obviously, in, in you know public libraries, that's that's similar. And that went out to our to to all librarians to be able to add to. And consequently, I thought it was really interesting to make sure that the evidence was accurate. There were some areas that people had said they're not here. So we did a couple more interviews of school librarians to make sure <clears throat> that all of that was covered. Covered. So my attitude is this is this is our best ever chance to get this right. So we want to do it right. We want it to be accurate. Um, and so, so that happened. Uh, male comparators were um, interviewed. Also really interesting. Interesting from an interviewer's point of view um, is that uh, as women, as you said, Tessa, often we downplay 
our skills or go because often the question was where did you learn that how were you trained in that skill and it was like it's a life skill or I'm a parent or I was it the play centre mum so I learned all of these skills and it was kind of like well I've just got them whereas men don't do that I'm sorry but male when you're interviewing males they're very um, very sure about where their skills are and where they lie and that they should be um, rewarded for having those skills so we need to change doing that a bit as well but this process is helpful um and then uh yeah so we've so we're now at the stage so this whole process takes time um and all of that um evidence comparing has gone on and last week uh we had um negotiations with the ministry um and I'm not allowed to tell you anything about them because um, they're still it's still um, ongoing. But that's kind of the length of time that you can look. It's not done yet. Um, but we, someone was asking the question about how long does this take? How long is a piece of string? It really depends on on all of the the things that have to happen. Um, how COVID will will you know let you do things? Where the things get held up along the way? My advice to anybody. Um, this has been an ex extremely hard work, but the most rewarding thing I think I have done for a, a, a very long time. So um, if you can be involved, either by being interviewed or by, by doing the interviewing or being part of a negotiating team or in any way, make sure you are informed, make sure you know what is going on, make sure you join your union. I'm sorry, but that's just basic. Um, and uh, and therefore you um, you have a say in your own future because you need to. We all need to stick together to, to make this happen for all of us. Is that enough? Yes. Happy to answer any questions that are specific to school librarians, but um, yeah, we've come a long way. Thank you, Claire, and thank you, Anna. I actually have to um, leave now. Um, but um, we're really looking forward to hopefully being able to tell members about that um, pay equity settlement, hopefully even before Christmas, but, you know, it still takes a while to unroll, to implement. Um, there's a whole lot of processes, because uh, like with the teacher aid um, settlement, it resulted in different steps and grades, and so it results in regrading, but in the end, also very significant um, amounts of increases to people's pay. So. Um, kia kaha the rest of you and um, always happy to share what we've done um, to compare and contrast and hopefully get better outcomes for everybody. Kakite. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Stephanie. It was lovely to have you here. I really appreciate your time. And thank you, Claire, for that um, for that update. And if anybody does have any questions, we will be answering them in the last 15 minutes. But now we would like um, to invite um, Sarah and um, Hannah Jenkins from Victoria University to share about what's been happening for TEU in this space. Sarah, Anna. Um, I, I think we'll just start with Hannah introducing herself because she has been one of our members um, doing the mahi to this point. So, Hannah, do you want to? Sure. Uh, kia ora everyone, so uh, ko Hannah Jenkins toko ingwa. Um, I'm currently a subject librarian at uh, Vic, so at Vic Uni, um, but I got involved when I was a library assistant here, um, and I got involved because to be honest I was really frustrated about what was going on with uh, library assistants um, and the pay, so um, the year, like, so last year um, I was working three jobs to pay my rent and to try and get by. Um, and two of them were precarious because universities, um, so I didn't have any hours in trimester three over summer. Um, and then when I was working at Vic full time, I was still like um, under the living wage. So that is pretty rough um, and it's really hard because in Wellington, I actually didn't know if I'd be like living here next year because I like really hard to pay rent. So um, just for context, like if you don't know the Wellington rental situation, I'm in like a three bedroom house, it's $900 a week. Um, and it's being increased by 250 next year. So like, that's kind of the situation at the moment. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, and so um, even though I'm, I'm, I'm in a different role now, I'm still involved. And so um, I'm in the reference group at the moment. Um, and what we're doing 
we're early we're at an earlier stage than PSA so we're not the interviewing situation yet we are at the moment more just kind of um talking to the other university library people and figuring out what roles are covered and um, what titles they're called and what skills are involved because they're called something different everywhere so um so that's what we've been working on because it's quite complicated um and also looking at numbers that you know so the stats that we're getting from the universities because there's been a lot of rollover a lot of hiring freezes so you know the the numbers are fluctuating at the moment um yeah so that's kind of what I've been involved in but it's also been a lot of um raising awareness so we've been chatting to our colleagues all the time and yarning about it and talking about their situation and we ha we had a little event when we handed the claim over so we have done that we've handed the claim to the VC and we had a little like Kai and corridor session so we um yeah so we all could like read through it and we could like answer those kind of questions that are a bit confusing like you know oh but my male coworker gets paid the same as me and we're doing the same job and it's like yeah yeah for sure but like they're also like covered by the pay equity claim so it's all about it's about everyone you know <laughs> it's like about um everyone is in this role as being underpaid for what they do and for the skills because it's because of like historical gender bias so like a lot of conversations around that were going on um yeah I think so that was like most of what I've been doing in the role um yeah and really I'm I guess why it matters it's pretty obvious I think if you're here you care about it um it's really just that it's super skilled work a lot of us have degrees have postgraduate degrees uh we have skills that we don't know we have like Tess has been talking about you know communication skills um highly technical skills like the the systems we use are very complicated and finding information is very complicated and then teaching people how to do that is complicated so you know there's a lot of mahi we do that we don't recognize especially if you've been in this job for a long time so it'd be cool to get recognized for it and also be able to like live and pay your rent and do that kind of stuff so yeah um <clears throat> so henna uh is one of um a group we've probably got about uh 15 uh people on that pay equity reference group across the country um so our claims are multi-employer meaning that we're raising the claims with every university employer that we have which is eight universities uh, in a multi-union, which means that we're working with the PSA and with TSA in raising these claims together. And so our pay equity reference group that Hannah sits on uh, has representation from across those universities. Uh, and um, we've been working, you know, as we were developing the claims, we've been working uh, within the TU, but the PSA and TSA members will be part of that as well. Um, what is interesting, uh, I should just say too, that we're now waiting for um, determination from the employers about arguability, whether they think that the claims that we've raised are arguable and therefore worthy of evaluation and assessment. So we are definitely at the start in comparison to NZDI, who sound like they're almost um, towards the end and um, the PSA who have been have, has done the work assessment. So we're at the start of that. What makes our claim uh, slightly unique, we're told by our um, legal expert, is that the tertiary education sector or the university sit outside of the core public sector. So there'll be a lot of testing of how pay equity claims will work. Um, sitting outside, we don't have a um, the same sort of relationship say that NZDI has to the Ministry of Ed. Uh, and so that does mean that there will be, um, it'll, it'll have to be tested in terms of how the government is involved and support this. As Stephanie said, you know, there's commitment and resources provided by the government to help these claims. So we're just, we're, we're waiting to see how that will work within our sector. Um, just a little bit more about the claim uh, for our library workers, we have included library assistants, library advisors, and assistant librarians uh, in our sector. Um, they are typically, um, within the university, they're typically sort of non-career pathway job, uh, library work. But, you know, one of our questions is, why? <laughs> Why are these non-career? Why isn't there? Why aren't there good pathways? Um, but they're definitely sit, sitting at the lower um, 
pay bands, I guess, of our library workers. And so we're not we're not yet raising claims for um, librarians or you know library managers. So I think that's important to have in mind as well when you think about our claim. Um, and yeah, I, th I think, um, I guess the only other thing I'll say is that um, we're at the start of it and really looking forward to um, doing that amazing work that uh, Tessa and Claire has described in terms of really uh, teasing out exactly what the wonderful workers in these spaces are doing and, and really raising um, the profile of their work. And I, I just, you know, really, um, it's quite moving, Tessa, to hear about the, the way that being involved in this process is actually raising a sense of self and identity in terms of the work that you will actually do. So we're really looking forward to that. And that's all I need to say about um, our claims. Cheers. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Hannah and Sarah. That's um, really interesting. Um, we now have some time for questions and there were a few questions that were sent in ahead of the session, but I noticed that there's a question from Alice in the um, chat that I'm not sure, Claire, maybe you might be able to answer. It says, for those of us in schools, should we be asking for an increase from step two to three before pay equity comes or after? Um, okay, so I'm not sure how much I'm allowed to say about this. Um, but uh, I think there will be more information coming out soon, but definitely yes. So this is not something, because the process, even when it's finalised and implementation is going to take some time, you've got, you, you certainly don't have to be doing this in the next two weeks or before school finishes. But yes, I would be advising, I think we are advising everyone to make sure that they are on the right place. Um, in the right uh, step or the right grade um, to what they consider they are, given that you now have a, a very up-to-date up to date uh, matrix, which describes um, very clearly what the skills are and the roles are in each of those levels. So if you can, um, um, for sure, if you need help um, and you're a union member, you will get it. Uh, if you're not, you're on your own, you need to um, join the union basically, sure, help. Great, thank you, Claire. Um, so there were a few questions that came in that I th think may have already been answered, but um, perhaps if we could just quickly go around. Um, so one of the questions was, how long does each union think the pay equity claims will take to, set, take to settle and what are the chances of successful settlement? Other sectors, for instance, health are still battling with pay equity claims after many years. So maybe we'll go to you first, Claire, because you're probably the closest and then uh, to NZI and then to PSA. Sorry, can you just quickly repeat that? I was trying to read questions at the same time. That was done. How yeah. long does each union think oh. the equity claims will take to settle and what are the chances of a successful settlement? Um, yeah, good question. Um, if I had a crystal ball. So obviously each um, each successful claim that um, that has been raised and completed has been has taken a different length of time. Having said that, uh, from the beginning, it's got quicker, obviously, because there is a, um, a, a, a a method that people are a lot more familiar with, that people are getting much better at, that there are already, there is, as um, Tessa said, a repository of um, male comparators or beam, even female-dominated roles that have had successful pay equity claims can be used. So therefore, it's a it's a group of people who are being paid at the rate that they should be paid at um, and have the conditions that they should have. So there are more of those, so that therefore there is less, um, I suppose, that can speed the process up. But, you know, like I said, we, are, uh, we, we raised our claim in November 2020. It looks, so it's next year is 2023. So, that gives you a length of time, but it's going to be different for, and, and I think also very different for each um, sector, for for each union, because of the, 
the relationships that you have and the things that you already have to go through and I'm assuming for each workforce because um, they're all slightly different all librarians but having different kind of roles and and um and interrelationships with different organizations so sorry that wasn't an answer um will they always be successful uh, yeah if you work hard enough and you fight hard enough i don't see why they shouldn't be but you know wonderful who Thank knows you, what's going to happen next year who knows um sarah or hannah did you want to comment on that question uh i mean as claire said it's a long as a piece of string um however we we are intentionally coming in after some of the claims have been settled because we know that that will help us and so i think she's uh, claire's right in terms of building on what's gone before and certainly access to comparators um we're hoping that will be useful i can say that um that we the for us, the employers uh, will be coming back about arguability uh, in April. So we that's that's quite a fair way away. So it's only then that we actually really get stuck in. So it's 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 going to take some time for us in our in our um, sector, I think. Cool. And uh, Tessa or Sarah from PSA, did you want to comment? Um, I guess in our experience, uh, our um, employers have been really dragging the process. I think we put our um, equity plan in 2019, so it's been a long time. Um, but ever since um, this year when we started doing the interviews and stuff and we did it with the HR, we've started having more regular meetings and more regular contact with it, so it does feel like they are more engaged so we're definitely moving the process along it's still taking longer than we wanted it to but um we're still pretty hopeful we're going to be able to start bargaining in the first half of next year yeah so uh, it'll happen thank you great another question was how do the unions expect that a successful claim for library assistance or the roles that you know obviously in um to you you've got a, a wider range of roles but how will these have them flow on benefit for the pay for other library staff do you have any thoughts on that well it, for us the um, public libraries and the psa we're expecting a positive flow on effect um, so your library assistants are at the bottom of the pay rate, but the people um, one or two rungs up aren't being paid that well either. So once we move up, most likely they'll get to, well, we hope that it's called pay relativity, like they'll move up as well, because they'll have to, the employer will have to move up. So we really, we're expecting a really positive flow on effect for everybody. Great. Sarah, do you want to comment? Uh, yeah, that, that's our view as well. And, and employers are always really keen to um, uphold relativity. And so I think it will put the pressure on um, for a lift in wages right through. That's what we're hoping. <laughs> Claire, did you want to comment or? Not, not quite so relevant in, yeah. in school libraries. So, you know. Yeah, great. Yes. Thank you. Um, and so uh, um, uh, I, th I think um, Stephanie Mills commented on there was a question around what might be the consequences uh, where pay increases need to be funded by employers facing funding cuts. But she did address that to some extent. But I would be interested to know if there are any other thoughts in that space as well. Um, any comments that you might like to make? I mean, I could comment and say that it's not, I don't want to say it's not our problem <laughs> where the money comes from, but to be honest, like this is like a gender inequity. So like if they're not, you know, if they're not pulling the line, they need to. So it's kind of just a, not really a, like we know it's going to be tough. Like we're in the university situation is horrendous right now. Like we're seeing cuts at Massey, AUT. We're worried about it happening at Vic. So like that, that is a worry, but um. <clears throat> at the end of the day like this is just kind of like fairness and to be honest like staff can't afford to pay basic human rights they can't afford to pay for their kids to go to school like to child care so that they can go to work they can't pay rent they can't pay the snapper card to get to work all that kind of stuff so like 
if you can't afford that, you can't have afford to have work, like workers, you know. So, yeah, yeah. my perspective anyway. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Sarah, did you want to comment? Uh, uh, Hannah's been on. Um, so I don't, I don't want to add to that. There. I, well, I will add one thing. Um, it's the government's commitment um, to achieve pay equity. They fund our universities. And so they are part of the solution as well. Cool. Um, there's a question in the chat. Australia has just passed, um, hang on, I've just lost it, has just passed pay transparency legislation, which has been shown to reduce the gender pay gap. What can we do to introduce this? Uh, there, is, uh, there is work being done um, by the government around pay transparency. Um, they are seeking, um, or they're involved in consultation around a bill, what a bill might look like. Uh, the CTU has also uh, written up a paper around pay transparency. And the Human Rights Commission have been um, strong in lauding pay transparency as one of the solutions as well. So I think, um, I think we will see quite a lot of action around pay transparency in next year. Um, so hopefully that will become part of our solution. Wonderful, thank you. So um, we have had some uh, some suggestions through this uh, session today about what the what people in the library and information sector can do to support these claims. Um, but maybe if we could just quickly go around um, the people who've been speaking today, and if you could just say one thing that you think uh, somebody should go off and do right now at the end of this webinar to help support the work that you have all been involved with, uh, that would be fantastic. Maybe we'll start with you, Claire. Oh, good. I get to start off. Very good. Well, I mean, I've already said it. I'll say it. I'll say it in my sleep. Um, join your union. It's not rocket science. Uh, we are stronger together, especially as women, especially in women who have been um, and undervalued in, in roles for so long. Um, I think the other thing is um, you're all librarians, so we're really good at finding out stuff. So make sure you are and stay informed. So um, that means you can find stuff on the internet. Uh, if you're not receiving what you think you should, the information that you think you should be receiving, get in touch with someone who should be giving it to you um, and make sure that you are as informed as you possibly can be so that you can make the best decisions going forward. Cool. So join the union and, and be informed, use your skills. Um, Tessa, would you like to suggest something? I would say oh, join the union, and if you're already a member, sign someone up to the union, and also just talk about pay equity. Make sure everybody you know is and understands what it is, so when it comes up, people support it. Um, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, Hannah? Um, yeah, I guess also, I think I know that libraries have really high union density, so if you're already a member, try and be really active so it doesn't have to be being involved in groups or committees it can just be like have a yarn with your co-worker doesn't have to be like oh do you know about pay equity it doesn't have to be awkward you can just kind of chat about their situation and then be like oh this thing's going on that might help or you know yeah so I guess just kind of keeping people in the loop make sure those conversations are happening you talk about pay rates you talk about where people are at that kind of stuff yeah cool thank you Sarah um, join your union, <laughs> and um, certainly we we are in our in our claim um, having those conversations, those sort of quiet conversations with colleagues, getting them involved and engaged. That's the best thing for within it, within our space at the moment because it's it's about um, ensuring that our whole community and our society sees this as a moral imperative. And then there is no way but to succeed in this. So that's that's what we're working on and um, that's what you can do to help. Thank you. I really want to thank you all so much, not only for coming along and sharing your mahi with us today, but actually for all the work that you have been doing over a really, really long period of time and to the colleagues that have undertaken that work with you. And uh, I think as Tessa said, uh, to all the people who have been interviewed for this, 
Um, it sounds like it was a, a, a time consuming, but really uplifting and interesting experience. It's really wonderful to hear sort of the, the different parts of the timeline that each of the, the, the claims are on and to get a bit more awareness of sort of the processes that you have been going through. So, um, yes, I really... Um, the valuing of, of roles and uh, I, um, I think Tessa again talked about you know realizing the skills that, that that you have that maybe didn't really realize were skills is a really empowering um, an, a, a outcome and and of course we hope for other more uh, lucrative outcomes along the way as well so thank you all so much and I would just ask um, Philip if he would do the closing karakia and then you can all go off into your day and go type up pay equity or something into Google <laughs> thank you Philip Rana, a maker of Ketato. Keto Namana Kitanga Etime Naro. Kironga Kitena, Kitena Otato. Kema here to Hua Makihikihi. Keto it the Kupu, Toyta Mana, Toyta Aroha, Toyta Reo Maori. Ket Tuturu, Kafakamawa Kietina, Homie Huye, Tai Kie. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Thanks.